Since their very public breakup with Apple, Intel's been focusing on self-improvement. Despite their previous shyness about giving customers more than a handful of cores on their CPUs, their 12th, 13th and 14th gen models now have P cores and E cores in abundance. Uh, at the high end, many of the more budget-friendly i3 and i5 processors still lack the efficiency cores that Intel have been so proud of lately. Thankfully, the P cores are what matters in gaming, and these ones reputedly deliver excellent performance all by themselves. Good enough, perhaps, that even a lowly, hyper-threaded quad-core might still be relevant in 2024. The i3-12100F is a multiplier-locked CPU from 2022 that is still on sale despite now being two generations old, though that latter fact is probably why it's so highly regarded among cheap um, bargain hunters. It's built on the 10 nanometer Alder Lake architecture with a base clock of 3.3 GHz, turbo of 4.3 GHz, 12 MB of L3 cache, a 60 watt TDP and a PL2 of 89 watts. As the cut price F version of the i3-12100, it currently sells for about £80, while the non-F version is available with integrated graphics for around about £100. Like most of Intel's regular iGPUs, this one isn't powerful enough for gaming by itself, so unless you need QuickSync for encoding and decoding video, or just want integrated graphics as an emergency backup, the F version could be the sensible choice. To see if what I've heard about the i3's performance is true, I'll be testing using a slightly overkill Z690 motherboard from MSI, specifically a Mag Torpedo DDR5 version. The RAM I've paired it with is 32 gigs of Corsair Vengeance DDR5 6000, which I did initially plan to test using the XMP profile, but I found that actually resulted in significantly lower results in Cinebench, so I used the CPU's default max memory speed of 4800 instead. While the 12100 and 12100F both come with perfectly usable stock coolers, I'm using the same Thermalright cooler I use in my AM5 tests, and to ensure flatness, I'm using a Thermalright contact frame. The GPU is a Radeon RX 6900 XT, which is a little on the older side now, but should be powerful enough to ensure the i3 is the bottleneck. Biggest numbers first, Valorant is relatively easy to achieve 200 FPS in, with even CPUs from a decade ago capable of the feat. As a DX11 title, it doesn't particularly benefit from increases in core count, but instead purely on clock speeds, IPC and level 3 cache. The 12100F's relatively large 12 meg L3 cache is doing well for it here, allowing it to achieve 300 FPS on average. This is on par with the older quad-core i7-6700K, which has less cache and lower IPC, but was clocked to 4.5 GHz. 300 FPS is of course extremely playable, and even the 184 FPS 1% lows are excellent, but it's far from the highest numbers I've ever seen in this game. For perspective, the Zen 3 based Ryzen 5 5600X might cost more, but it can score about 70% higher at 520 FPS. In performance mode, the 12100F can drive almost equally high numbers in Fortnite. The average is a whopping 277 FPS, and 1% lows are a less impressive but still acceptable 131. I've still yet to completely understand what Fortnite wants from a CPU, and my historical results are a little all over the place, so maybe don't focus too much on the chart? I will say that this wasn't a particularly smooth experience, even by the standards of the game some people call Stutter Night, with some of the lowest point ones I've seen lately, and even after three matches the frame time spikes were still pretty severe. While this is, of course, mostly Epic's fault, better CPUs generally seem to give better results. Unsurprisingly, Counter-Strike 2 is a decent high refresh experience on the 12100F2. The roughly 200 FPS average falls in line with the old quad-core flagship, the i7-6700K, and 1% lows follow the pattern of being about half the average. 
As a DX11 title, CS2 doesn't benefit much from extra cores, so for example the 6 core i7-8700K is only 17% faster. The modern Ryzen's in the Zen 3 and 4 families have more cores as well, but they also have 2.5 times more cache and higher boost clocks, which I suspect is why they attain such ridiculously high speeds in these multiplayer shooters. Call of Duty Warzone is one of the fairly rare examples of a competitive online game with AAA ambitions, rendering using the DX12 API and so leveraging higher core count CPUs much more readily. It also generally performs much worse than your Fortnites and CSs, so frame rates above 200 are much more rare. The 12100F can break past 100 FPS, so while it might not fully utilise a high refresh monitor, it's still better than a normal TV experience. However, the 6 core CPUs really start to show their superiority here. Moving into the single player arena, the i3-12100F has the dubious honour of being the first quad-core CPU I've tested that can achieve a 60-plus average in Starfield's New Atlantis. It's not a constant 60, of course. 1% lows drop as far as 44, and 0.1s are around the 30 mark, but on the whole, if you have a good enough GPU to pair with it, this should be a decent starting point for anyone looking to play Bethesda's somewhat maligned RPG. As the 12100F is primarily of interest to budget builders, I think it would be fair to assume that Cyberpunk's RT mode isn't on a potential owner's radar. The quad-core i3 has enough power to drive a solid experience in Night City with regular rasterized rendering, however, seeing up to 97 FPS with 1% lows of 55. With RT enabled, the 12100F fails to hit a 60 average, so an upgrade to an i5 might be worth it if you are thinking about pairing one with a decent ray tracing GPU. The Last of Us leans pretty hard on the CPU from the get-go, which does mean it's easy to waste GPU power if your processor isn't up to the job. If you are happy with a 60 plus average, the i3 can deliver one. In fact, it averaged over 80 FPS in the test scene, however 1% lows did drop below the mark and ended up well into the 40s. This seems to be standard for quad cores in this title, so it needs at least 6 physical cores to achieve a smooth 60 FPS. I went and bought Dragon's Dogma 2, as it looked like a promising title to swap Jedi Survivor for in my CPU test suite. Uh, that was before it turned out to be an even bigger steaming pile of bad optimization than the Respawn game, but hey, I've spent the money, I might as well try and make some content with it. My only tests before now were with the Ryzen 5 7500F whereby a walk around the first major city area averaged 60 FPS, but 1% lows dropped all the way to 30. This isn't unexpected behaviour for this game, from what I can tell, and trying to chase a smooth experience here right now might seem like a fruitless endeavour, but I thought I'd give the i3 a chance. <laughs> well, I needn't have bothered. The game runs like it suffered a hernia. Even with settings dropped, the game stops and stutters every so often, sometimes pausing for a few seconds at a time. I made three attempts, with the second being the worst and the third being worse than the first, so clearly this isn't a game to try with a quad-core CPU. Or any CPU for that matter. Microsoft Flight Sim is a title many people have told me doesn't require high frame rates, and I tend to believe them, but it's still worth bearing in mind that it really doesn't do too well with quad cores. Weaker CPUs than this one occasionally have problems with horrendous pop-in, and while that isn't the case here, it does still produce a sub-60 FPS average. If you're anything beyond a mere casual flyer, you'll probably want to invest a few extra quid or bucks or whatever into an i5 or something with a few more cores than this.
Civilization 6 rounds out the gaming benchmarks, and the AI benchmark completed with a quite healthy average turn time of just 6.37 seconds. Closing out the benchmarks with a couple of fairly unrealistic productivity tests. DaVinci Resolve is one program that actually uses Intel iGPUs for their quick sync decoding functionality, and so it's worth picking up the non-F version for that reason alone. That would be if the CPU was worth buying at all. General timeline scrubbing seemed okay, but mostly unimpressive, and the 4K H.264 render completed in 25 minutes 47 seconds a small drop from the 6700K render time, but a country mile behind chips like the Ryzen 5 5600X. Finally, the Blender Classroom test takes about 12 minutes 32, more than double the time of some of the cheaper Ryzen's, but like Resolve, if time is of the essence, you're probably better off using GPU rendering anyway. There really isn't anything about the i3-12100F that could convert me back into a quad-core believer. I kinda hoped the bigger cache and better IPC would mean it closed the gap with older 6 and 8 cores, but for the most part those aging, high consumption flagship CPUs still have a performance advantage over the i3, if not an efficiency advantage. The more realistic competition for the i3, at least from the models I've tested so far, is the Ryzen 5 5600. The numbers I obtained are from the 5600X, which is a touch more expensive, but performs about the same as the non-X when both chips have PBO and Core Optimizer applied. Both the i3 and the Ryzen chip are on platforms which don't have particularly exciting futures, so neither has much appeal for the enthusiast builders out there, but for those looking to squeeze as much value as possible, both LJ1700 and AM4 still have some great upgrade paths. The Ryzen costs about 42% more than the i3 in the UK right now, and in most games it does not give 42% more performance with the exception of the highly cache-sensitive titles like Valorant and CS2. In productivity, however, the 6-core is more than worth the extra expense. At the end of the day, then, the i3-12100F still has an audience. It's not for modern AAA gaming at 60-plus FPS, nor is it for 4K video editing, but it can still provide a decent entry point for eSports and older AAAs. If this is all you can afford, or if the alternative is getting a better CPU but a cheaper, lower performing GPU, then it might be the right compromise to make. However, don't be too shocked when you come across some poorly optimised 2023 and 2024 titles that run like absolute ass. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.